It's not gold rising, it's the dollar and currencies falling. That's the whole thing. It's credit going down. So the idea that this is a gold bull market is actually a misnomer. It's a bear market for fiat currencies. So I have to ask you, um, dear viewer, I have to ask you, how's your faith in this um, cr and, and credit in your currency uh, evolving? Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the JR Mining Guy over on X and of course your host of this channel. And I'm looking forward to welcoming back one of our fan favorites here on the channel. It's Alistair McCloud. He's the head of research over at Gold Money and author of the McCloud Finance Substack. Something you, or a Substack you should definitely take a closer look at. He does a phenomenal job explaining the financial world focused on credit. And uh, he, he wants you to understand what is happening. Why, why is gold moving? What are the intricacies of credit? And how is it related to everything? And uh, why does the gold price keep going up? That's the, the number one question we're trying to answer today here on Soar Financially. And uh, we will discuss a few things. Like we'll, of course, talk about the BRICS meeting that happened about 10 days ago in Kazan, Russia. What came out of it? And uh, you might have seen the title of this video. I will probably call it BRICS Gold Currency. Is it a hoax? I have a couple angles I want to explore this topic from. And uh, Alistair is the perfect guest to do that with. So let's, uh, let's dive in with our guest. And uh, if you haven't done so, and the best way to support us, which doesn't cost you a single thing, is to hit that like and subscribe button it helps us out tremendously and uh, we can bring guests like Alistair on frequently and uh, Alistair wants to come on frequently I know that so and uh, Alistair um, you know great to have you back on the program it's good to see you again absolute fan favorite here thank you for having me back yeah, we, we got lots to talk about. Lots has happened again since we last spoke about four months ago. So a lot, lot, lots to catch up on. And the, one of the big items I want to talk about, one of the big topics, of course, is the BRICS meeting. Um, let, let's start with a bit of a summary before we get into some of the intricacies and uh, some of the details. But uh, what was your main takeaway from the BRICS meeting? Did it surprise you at all? Um, it, it didn't, actually, because we were being um, warmed up, as it were. Uh, there were two big things. You know, apart from the evolution, I'll come on to that in a second. The two big things were that um, this new settlement currency, trade settlement currency, wasn't going to happen. Um, and indeed, uh, Putin told us that the day before uh, the summit. So on the Friday before the summit, um, confirming it. That one didn't surprise me at all, because uh, monitoring all the mood music that's been coming out of interested parties, if you like, um, you know, people who think they know what they're doing and speculating and so on. It was quite clear they hadn't got a clue what was going on. Um, and, they, you know, they were sort of trying to invoke CBDCs and blockchains. And I mean, you know, they just didn't understand credit is a short answer, which by my, which incidentally is my mission to get people to understand credit. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I think that um, the hair was set running um, before the Johannesburg meeting, which was August 23, when there was a leak out of leak, I mean, it may have been deliberate um, out of the Russian embassy in Nairobi, of all places, uh, saying that um, a gold backed um, trade settlement currency was going to be on the agenda uh, in Johannesburg. It didn't make it. And the reason is really quite simple. If you look back, uh, India uh, is not ready at all. She doesn't have enough gold reserves um, to, to uh, if you like, consider it reintroducing gold into the global monetary system. And not only that, but she trades as much with uh, the Western nations as she does with with Asian nations. So, um, you know, isn't, it wasn't in her interest to uh, support something which could well have undermined the financial system in the West, which indeed reintroducing gold um, into securing the value of credit uh, of any sort uh, was bound to do. Uh, China equally, um, you know, is not ready for it because she depends so much on exports to America and Europe in particular. Uh, and so on that basis, um, no. And also it wasn't in her DNA to do it. I mean, the way China works is um, she lets others make the mistakes. You know, she doesn't actually proactively go out and seek positions. Um, and, um, you know, her success against um, America and um, de-dollarization and all the rest of it has just been let the, let the Americans make all the mistakes, which they have 
done. And why interrupt someone when they're making all the mistakes? That's their view. Um, and, uh, you know, these guys have been doing this since Confucius was a lad. So, you know, this quite simply is the Chinese way. Um, they are evolutionary, not revolutionary. Let's put it that way. So um, this wasn't going to happen this time either. Um, and that was becoming absolutely clear. The Russians, of course, would like to see the reintroduction of gold because there are two things about that. Firstly, she's got a persistent uh, export surplus because she exports raw materials and she doesn't import nearly as much in terms of compensating um, you know, consumer goods and so on and so forth. Um, so from her point of view, yeah, she wanted to be paid in sound money, you know, which which is a point that Glaziev made uh, uh, writing for um, uh, a Moscow business uh, um, paper back in December 2022. So, um, you know, th that's where it lined up. OK, Russian presidency got us all hoping that there would be a gold settlement currency in the offing. But no, um, you need to have unanimity within uh, within BRICS um, to get something on the agenda. So that wasn't going to happen. The other thing which uh, was really foreshadowed from the uh, previous summit in Johannesburg was the creation of uh, a new class, if you like, of BRICS um, member. You know, not direct membership because it becomes too unwieldy, if you like, uh, but more have an interim phase like um you know a partner they call it a partner i would have thought an associate was a better word in english but anyway they have called it a partner now i saw um uh, a list of these potential partners leaked but i haven't seen anything since if that list is right then it's actually quite major um we see uh, countries like Indonesia, we've got Thailand, we've got Malaysia, we've got Vietnam, which basically China ties up the Chinese diaspora, with a few exceptions like the Philippines uh, um, in Southeast Asia. And they're very populous as well. Uh, and on top of that, you have got Nigeria, a very populous country with um, a significant GDP, uh, and uh, also Turkey, which is an interesting one because um, you know, there is no doubt that Turkey is drifting away, having been refused entry into the EU. She's drifting away from uh, the Western alliance, even though she's still a member of NATO and sees her future more, um, if you like, as um, if you like the leading light in the Turkish uh, nations um, throughout Central Asia. I mean, that goes all the way towards Mongolia. So you can see that from Turkey's point of view, she's playing a strategic game. But again, no one in this wants to upset the Americans unduly. They're getting a little bit of safety in numbers. But um, the problem with upsetting the Americans is that some of these guys owe money to Americans. And if they don't, they've got dollars. This is perhaps Saudi's one of the reasons why Saudi Arabia hasn't activated her BRICS membership. Uh, and um, the other thing is, of course, the Americans are not uh, beyond organizing regime change with someone they don't like. So <laughs> on that basis, um, you find that uh, you know, there's a lot of caution in this. The other thing uh, which is confirmed, and this shouldn't surprise uh, us, is that uh, China and Russia effectively are using the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS uh, as, um, uh, uh, if you like, a, a, an alternative to the West. And so what she's looking to do is to build her own markets, which are not dollar centric. Um, you know, like grains, um, they also mentioned a precious metals market, you know, for gold, silver, also diamond market, um, other metal markets going to follow and all the rest of it. Um, they're replicating the financial system with their own version of the IMF in the um, new development bank and, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So they are setting up a complete parallel organization, but this is going to take time. I mean, the de-dollarization issue, assuming that events don't intervene, which I believe they will, but let's assume for a moment events are not going to intervene. This is a 30, 40 year project. So, um, you know, this is not going to be an overnight, overnight deal. Um, anyway, that's the background to BRICS. And uh, I await your next question. 
Yeah, absolutely. No, it's really interesting. Like, and in, I think we need to follow on one of the last things you've you've just mentioned, and uh, it's it's really setting up their own independent markets. And I'm really curious how that will impact a the, you know the global financial system, but also in particular since we're a commodity focused channel. Of course, the precious metals here. Um, you mentioned uh, you know separate precious metals markets. What what could that look like, and what 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 is going to be the impact of something like that? Well, I think they've in, in in a sense they've already done it. I mean, you got the Shanghai. Uh, um, gold exchange. You got the Shanghai Futures Exchange. You got a Moscow Gold Exchange, um, uh, and you've got supporting actors uh, ar around the Asian region. I mean, you know, um, the gold exchanges in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. You've also got, of course, uh, Dubai and the UAE, which who are major players in in, in gold and silver. Uh, so that's that's something which. Um, you know, in a sense, uh, I think I think the idea is to try and consolidate this into into markets which don't use the dollar. But as I say, that's got to be a very long term uh, prospect um, because everything is priced in dollars. And uh, the problem that they have is if you're going to get people to use um, something other than the dollar, it's got to be better than the dollar. So what's that going to be? Well, there's only one thing that's better than the dollar, and that's a non fiat currency, a currency which is a gold substitute. Uh, and, um, you know, as we just discussed, we're a long way from that. No, um, how would you go about strengthening those positions, though, the Shanghai market, for example? Is, that, is it just by sheer volume? You, you really increase the importance, and it seems like they're really driving a lot of volume through Shanghai at the moment. Um, is that a way you would approach that? Like, how do you make it more internationally relevant? How do you get away from the LBMA or the, the COMEX, for example? Well, uh, you let the LBMA and COMEX do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, basically, um, you know, where's the demand? The demand is in Asia. I mean, you look, just look at the Chinese housewives. They save something like two or three trillion dollars equivalent every year. Where does that go? I mean, some of it goes into gold, obviously. And, um, uh, you know, meanwhile, um, our people over here, our populations are completely disinterested. Uh, so, you know, the market's going that way. The other thing I would say is that we, uh, you know, when we talk about gold and silver, we're actually talking about uh, um, uh, derivative markets rather than physical markets. Physical deliveries are an inconvenience, if you like. So, uh, you know, it's all about forwards and it's about futures. Um, it's different in Asia. You know, the Shanghai Gold Exchange is a physical market. Um, Dubai is a physical market. So I would say that uh, you know, the risk to the LBMA and um, I think also to, to, to COMEX is if we have a derivatives meltdown, <laughs> you know, then we'll be virtually no market in the West. Um, I mean, I think that, I, that's, that's a slight exaggeration, but you can see what I mean. I mean, if, if let's just say we get uh, counterparty failures, particularly in London, um, you know, on a rising gold price, rising silver price, you know, a, the establishment being squeezed, whatever, then uh, that really does become a very serious issue. And, uh, you know, we haven't really got anything to replace it. So, you know, again, it's the Chinese approach. You know, just let everybody else make the mistakes. And we just sit yeah. here and just pick up the pieces. Yeah, we're working hard at it. Like you, you mentioned the Chinese housewives and like the savings is interesting because I had that conversation. I forgot who it was. Might, might have been Simon Hunt here on the channel as well. But the the the, uh, the savings rate, the personal savings rate in China is right around 50%. In the US, well, it's 4.8%. Yeah, um, that's that. That fifty percent is basically the difference between GDP on an income basis and GDP on a production basis. So uh, that includes corporate, um, you know, capital accumulation, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, but the housewives, uh, you're looking at a savings rate of about thirty five percent of GDP. Yeah. Yeah. This is mega. I mean, it really is absolutely enormous. Yeah, um, I think and, Europe is thirteen percent. Germany is, I think, around thirteen <coughs> percent, I believe. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, America is very low. We're very low, and we've just had a budget which is designed to destroy savings. So, you know, <laughs> you can see which way you were going. No, um, Alison, we need to follow up a bit on the, you know, the the BRICS currency, like. There was talk before the event in, in Kazan, of course, about uh, the unit um, based on Project Enbridge. A lot of 
smart people were talking about a 40% gold back currency um, here. Like, is that completely off the table? Like, it's really, I, I just need to clarify because so much effort went into project yeah. uh, into, into that, uh, the unit. And uh, yeah. we're actual facts. It was like, it wasn't made up out of thin air or just wishful thinking. It was a real debate. And uh, you, you, you said like, if you want to replace the US dollar, you need something valuable. And I, I personally thought it's as better. well, okay, maybe maybe it's the unit mm. um, that, that might be better because it is at least partially backed by something tangible, right? Yeah. But uh, that seems to be completely off the table now. No, well, the, the unit never was on the table. I mean, I looked at it and it, it was so full of faults, uh, you know, it just wouldn't work. Um, it was quite clear that the authors didn't understand credit. Um, there was absolutely no mention of what interest rate um, you know, credit based on the unit would bear. I mean, yeah. you know, it's fundamental, and they miss that entirely. Yeah. Can, now, can I ask you, Alistair, that? just to jump in? Like, can you quickly explain for viewers because we got new viewers here on this channel as well? Like, what what do you mean by credit? Like, just quickly. I know without going into a two hour discursion here because we can probably okay. fill uh, university okay. halls with that. But uh, ex ex just explain that concept of credit real quick before we dive deep into that and why they're not understanding it properly. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, you got to you've got you've got to come at it from two two different angles. I mean, credit today is quite simply um, something that is owed, if you like, uh, because the other side of it is an obligation, an obligation to pay. Um, and everything is credit. If you look at a bank balance sheet, you know, you've got deposits on one side and you've got liabilities on the other side. So, uh, well, liabilities to deposit holders on the other side, as far as the bank is concerned, deposit holders are a liability, which they have got to discharge. So your deposit is basically, it's not money that you own. It is an obligation of your bank to pay you. So the definition of credit basically is you have credit on one side and you have an obligation on the other side. Always. It is not final settlement. Final settlement is the discharge of a debt absolutely. And that can only be done with real money, which is gold or silver, um, depending on, on, on uh, uh, you know, what standard you, you, you operate on. Um, but going back to, to uh, the situation with the unit, uh, the problem there is that the, audit, the, you know, the authors of this did not understand um, the way in which money and credit actually works. In a functioning economy, you do not use money at all. I mean, very exceptionally, you might just use money, but I mean, that's as, as, as exceptional as using Bitcoin. I mean, you know, it doesn't happen. It is always um, uh, using credit. So what happens is that the banks create the credit on the back of, let's say, a gold standard. The credit is guaranteed. The value of the credit is guaranteed by its link to the gold standard with an additional risk factor for the you know, the possibility that the, uh, uh, um, you know, the debtor, which in this case is the bank, might not discharge its obligations. So everything is credit. So, you know, these guys who put together the unit, uh, there's no mention of credit. How do they think this works? I mean, this is rather like the idiots in Bitcoin. I mean, you know, they just don't understand how an economy functions and the role of money and credit. Money almost never credit entirely. The other thing I looked at um, is I thought I better see who these clowns were who put together this unit thing. And it transpired there are a couple of investment managers. <laughs> you know, I mean, one was a Russian, another was a Chinaman. And you sort of think, well, there's a Russian name, there's a Chinese name. And you think this is put together on, you know, by a committee, if you like, of Russians and Chinese, of the Russian and Chinese joint governments. I mean, it wasn't. It's just a couple of fund managers speculating. And they didn't know what they're talking about. But, I mean, they got all these hairs run. It got everybody terribly excited. But, I mean, you just had to look a little more deeply to see that the whole thing was actually a farce. So, you know, forget this unit thing. And, of course, the other thing is everybody starts talking about, oh, CBDCs. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, that's a load of hogwash. The world doesn't work on that basis. It really doesn't. Uh, and then you have, um, you know, the Bank of International Settlements, which, um, again, I think is losing the plot, um, you know, sort of putting together Enbridge and all the rest of it. I mean, it's, you know, this isn't necessary. Really, what you need is a decent interbank market, because that is the basis in which banks will clear. If you don't have that 
that interbank market, then a bank will not create credit for you because they need to balance their books continuously. And they do that through an interbank market. Now, obviously, SWIFT was central to the interbank market in the West. And that is basically what needs to be re replaced. But Russia and China have already put together, um, uh, you know, systems to replace that. Um, I don't know whether every bank is signed up to it, but I can bet you, you know, I can I, I'd make a, um, you know, a, a bet, a very, very strong bet that any bank offering credit, Chinese or Russian bank, is already signed up to this. And any other bank um, who would be permitted, if you like, by whoever runs, you know, that swift replacement, um, they'd be in there as well. You know, if their business is trade settlement, then, yeah, you've got to do that. I mean, you know, assuming you're, you're settling, let's say, in yuan or, um, uh, you know, possibly rubles. Rubles is unlikely because of um, sanctions. But you can see that um, that's actually all you need. You need a functioning interbank market. That's all you need to replace. And that's actually not all that difficult to do. Everybody's been sort of banging on about how difficult it is to replace SWIFT and all the rest. I don't think it's that difficult. It shouldn't be, right? From a pragmatic point of view, it, it shouldn't be that difficult. But yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's like you just need the amount of number and the amount of transactions to, to, make, to make sense. And you need enough trade partners and partners that are willing to use it. Is that uh, a fair assumption? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, interesting. Like, um, I think we could put a bow around the BRICS meeting. Is like, is there any other, like, how would you call it? Maybe in the, in the next twelfth month, anything that you'll see that'll transpire out of it that could, for lack of a better term, upset the global financial order? Is there anything, or is that just, uh, are we just chipping away? Yes, de-dollarization is happening, but it is happening at the constant slow rate. Um, is there anything that was announced or anything that would say, oh, this could be that that moment? I, I, I personally don't think so. No, I don't think so. I mean, let, we'll, we'll wait. We'll wait an official list of um, partner uh, nations, as it were. Um, but um, I mean, other than that, no, it's going to be a long, slow process. And I personally think that it'll all be overtaken by a collapse of credit in the West, the value of credit in the West. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, and the thing that's fascinating is that, um, you know, all this speculation about uh, will they, won't they um, come up with a new trade settlement currency. Um, when Putin said no, gold continued to rise. So what's all that about? Were people buying gold because they thought that it was going to be announced? No, not at all. There's something else going on. And perhaps that's the next topic we should be talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and uh, people just saw me writing down uh, credit in the West. I think that's the topic we need to talk about. Yeah. Um, a, will the West be able to service its its, its obligations? Will be will it, will they be able to pay off the credit or at least uh, settle the tr the credit at some point ever? Um, and we, we need to get a bit more granular. We do need to talk about the Fed because it does have a big influence on mm. just global economics. Um, we have a Fed meeting in exactly one week here, Alistair. Um, maybe we start there. Um, what, what does that look like? What's the credit situation in the US, for example, right now? And how does the Fed uh, influence it or can it influence it? Well, excessive is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, it, it, the first thing is that when you look at the private sector, um, the expansion of credit by banks really should be aimed at uh, financing production, providing capital to, to, to manufacturers, to providers of services and all the rest of it. It is not something that uh, you know, should be expanded um, uh, to finance consumption. Now, um, one can accept, uh, perhaps, that um, there is a demand for mortgages to finance um, large purchases, like for houses or even motors, things like that. But in terms of uh, financing day-to-day -day consumption, uh, that is just inflationary. Uh, it's it, it's quite simple. At the government level, I mean, I think I think I'm right in saying that the level of uh, consumer debt in the United States is about 71% of GDP. Um, a lot of that's mortgages, car loans, whatever. But um, you know, the savings rate has dipped. Um, last I saw, it was just about zero, really, uh, and. Um, a falling savings rate is, is inflationary as well. And if you look at the uh, high savings um, uh, nations, you find that uh, you know their tendency towards inflation is actually very, very muted. I mean, Japan is a very good example. And so is China, incidentally. I mean, you know, economists keep on telling us that, uh, oh, they're in real trouble because they're going to go into you know, falling prices or whatever. Well, we'll pass that rubbish, pass on that rubbish anyway. <laughs> um, 
but as far as the, the real debt problem now is governments. Governments have been spending um, like drunken sailors for decades. And we're now in a position where uh, US debt to GDP is about 135%. Um, now, that's fine so long as interest rates were zero, as long as bond yields were no more than 1%, but that's no longer the case. So they've got into a debt trap. Quite simple, it's been sprung on them. Uh, and all this talk about uh, de-dollarization and all the rest of it doesn't exactly encourage foreign buyers to continue financing um, US Treasury debt. Uh, and um, I mean, we've already seen that, um, you know, China um, has been reducing uh, her um, holdings of U.S. treasuries. On top of that, um, uh, Japan, the Japanese institutions have taken some pretty nasty losses on the rise in interest rates. And also um, in, uh, you know, the flu currency fluctuations, which, you know, initially have been sort of quite good for them with a very weak uh, yen. But after that, um, you know, they were crucified on the bounce and now it's weakening again. I suppose they're saying, phew, sigh of relief. But basically, the appetite for investing in US treasuries from foreign institutions has declined. Um, and I think that they're going to have a big problem financing a continuing budget deficit, which I would suspect in the year to next September, their fiscal year, the current fiscal year, could well exceed two and a half trillion. Um, I don't care who gets in. Um, this is this is uh, um, uh, you know a very serious situation. So the mixture of financing that and um, uh, refinancing maturing debt, which seems to be running at around about I don't know anything between seven and ten trillion a year. Uh, maybe even more, uh, you know, this refinancing, um, uh, you know, is all being done at higher and higher levels. Um, what the U.S. Treasury are doing, I mean, they they recognize the problem. And what they've been doing is they've been just funding it short term. So the debt prof profile is now, now about 65 months um, to maturity. You know, this is dangerous. This is very, very dangerous. Uh, we had a similar situation in this country back in the 1970s. Um, I keep on repeating this in various <laughs> interviews, but it bears repetition that uh, our crisis, we had the IMF came in, incidentally, and the IMF, um, uh, uh, you know, imposed um, uh, sanctions on, on, uh, on the government and told them how, you know, how to run the, run the affairs. Um, and we had no alternative. And the consequence of that was that interest rates shot up, the cost of funding shot up, and uh, we had three guilt issues, 15%, 15 and a quarter, 15 and a half percent. Now, just imagine what that level of um, coupon would do to U.S. Treasury finances. I mean, it'd be completely disastrous. I'm not saying necessarily we'll see 15 percent. I mean, but equally, I can't see how it's going to stop there. Because we had this problem with a, a debt to GDP of, I think, something like 60 odd percent. I mean, it was way, way, it's half where we are now, almost half. Um, when you get such a huge level of debt, a debt mountain that has to be refinanced, and foreigners who are the marginal buyers reluctant to finance it, um, you can see that it won't actually be terribly long before domestic US institutions begin to think, hold on, we don't actually want to have um, long-term uh, US Treasury notes uh, because of the duration risk. I, th I think that's already happening. As far as the banking sector is concerned, uh, they've learned the hard way about duration risk. I mean, Silicon Valley and all the rest of it were part of that history last year. So, you know, they're not going out along the U curve, and nor should they. I mean, a bank actually should have uh, relatively liquid short-term um, uh, um, uh, assets. Um, which it can realize at any time without making huge, great losses. Um, and, you know, I mean, if you go out 10, 15 years along the yield curve, uh, you know, you can wipe out your equity very, very quickly, particularly when you've got the levels of leverage um, on bank balance sheets uh, that they have today. So, so what you're saying, maybe just to summarize a bit, you 10 year and 30 year bond yields should be way higher than let's say the four week, the eight yeah. week or the, the 52 week right now, which are pretty much on par right now. They're almost yeah. equal. I think the 10 year is 
exactly equal to the 52 week and uh like when you when you mentioned duration risk like why would i bother buying a 10 year like it doesn't give me any added value besides yeah. added risk running into potential like debt default which i don't know what, what's your actually likelihood of a us what's your um of a us debt default is that a, is that likely do you, do you consider that like i think it's um unless there's a very smart uh, turnaround in policy i think it's certain I mean, the debt default will not be, um, you know, uh, the U.S. government not uh, honoring its debts um, or not, you know, not paying out on coupons. It will be through the um, depreciation of the currency. And they've got other problems, too, because when you see uh, um, bond yields rising uh, because of the debt trap, then uh, there are a whole rafts of um, private sector enterprises that are going to go under um, because, you know, everybody got used to interest rates um, being close to zero, you know, zero interest rate policy. Um, you know, that's no longer the case. And, uh, you know, I mean, we've got that in this country. A, 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 a classic example is a utility called Thames Water. It's the la our largest water company serving the London area. And um, the great thing about a utility is that the earnings are stable. And because they're heavily regulated, the water regulator guarantees the return uh, on equity. You know, that is all built into the equation. Now, you can't necessarily get more if you like, but you're going to get this minimum time and time again. Now, that's a bankable deal. So what happens? Uh, private equity comes along, takes this certain income stream and leverages it up with debt four or five times. Now, that was fine when debt cost nothing. <laughs> But, um, you know, Thames Water is at the moment is trying to refinance itself and um, it's bust. <laughs> so uh, that, is, I think, is, a, is, is an absolute classic example of where an awful lot of uh, the private sector has got itself into. Not just yeah. in this country, but in America, in Europe as well. Um, and also, I mean, Japan, um, when the Japanese and they will be forced to raise interest rates quite sharply, um, you know, that's going to going to be an absolute disaster for the Japanese economy. I have a micro question before we I want to talk more about rising interest rates and where you think or what you think the Fed should be doing here in the next uh, next meeting here. Um, the micro question is like the United States 30 year mortgage rate is actually up since the Fed cut interest rates uh, mm -hmm. about four weeks or five weeks ago, uh, which yeah. is interesting because it dropped down to was it 6.1%. Now we're at 6.7 mm -hmm. 6.8% on average for the 30 year. Um, how do you explain that? Like, I, it, I, I came across and I couldn't make sense of it. Maybe you can help me understand that part because I think it might be quite interesting for some of our viewers here in the U.S. as well. Yeah, um, it's, I mean, it's basically, uh, you know, um, a function. I mean, it, well, the easiest way to look at it is when you've got um, yields on the long end of the yield curve rising like that, then basically um, the uh, interest rate on all long-term debt uh, is going to, tend to rise with it. The other way you can look at it is you can say, well, there's very little liquidity for that form of lending. And indeed, you know, as I said earlier, most of, um, uh, you know, financial liquidity, you know, banks, money funds and all the rest of it is all going into very, very short term stuff because they don't want duration risk. And if nobody wants duration risk, then I'm afraid the mortgage rates, along with anything other uh, in terms of long term uh, financing is going to cost more. So. You know, or you could you could sort of sound slightly technical and say the yield curve is become, is going positive. <laughs> Which yeah, is it's, 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 it's interesting, like because I, I already know from like friends in Canada, for example, that some of their mortgage deals they have they're like two three years, and then they have mm. to refinance. Like one friend had a one year mortgage, and then he had to yeah. refinance. So is is that a trend that that is continuing? We'll have to look at shorter and shorter mortgage rates to keep the interest somewhat calculable, because you said like. Um, you know, the, the 30 year, like there's a lot of risk and uh, debt default risk that uh, you need to con take into consideration here. Yeah. Um, well, it, I mean, interestingly, the majority of mortgages in this country, in, 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 in Britain, have been, um, you know, sort of one, two, three year um, fixed rates. Mm -hmm. But of course, they all become due. Uh, and um, you know, the the uh, the end of, of ZERP, uh, as it were, was about two years ago. So, of course, this is all now 
um, becoming extremely expensive for people with mortgages. Um, and uh, it's very difficult, I think, for anyone now really to get uh, finance uh, to pay large mortgages. And I mean, this is a problem all around Europe. I mean, I was I was in Sweden. Um, I had a meeting with the Riksbank in Sweden um, was it earlier this year. And we were talking about the, you know, the, the property market there, the residential property market and mortgages and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, the, the uh, um, board members in the Riksbank uh, had a pretty good idea about the dangers of this. Um, and they tried to persuade the government to uh, open up the rental market, you know, stop treating uh, uh, landlords like pariahs, um, which is again what we do in this country. You know, I mean, they, you know, they, they um, cause homelessness. I mean, you, you know, you, you've seen the script. I mean, it's a load of rubbish. Uh, but um, they can't persuade their politicians uh, that this is the case. So the politicians are complicit in creating uh, a crisis within the residential property markets. I think we should bear that in mind. I mean, it, it is it is nonsensical, uh, the whole thing. And I think that um, one of the problems, I think, with, uh, um, you know, a credit crunch, a credit crisis, um, not only does it raise interest rates, uh, but it creates a shortage of credit, which basically means that things that depend on credit for their value uh, um, are going to decline in value. Uh, and it's going to hit the housing market, I think, very, very hard. Uh, so, and that is the the basis of a lot of bank collateral. So it comes back, if you like, into the banks. And another thing I ought to mention is that the relationship between equity markets and bond yields has become incredibly stretched. In fact, more stretched than I can see throughout history, throughout the history that I can record anyway. Uh, and, um, you know, that tells me that the current trend of rising bond yields, which has only just really started over the last two months, as that continues, it's going to trip up equity markets. And you're going to have a very nasty slide in equities. And that, again, is the other side of collateral for banks. So, you know, the whole, um, the entire financial system is, is tottering on the edge. And it's not going to take an awful lot to push it over. No, in, in, interesting comments there. Like maybe we need to explore that uh, relationship between the bond market and the stock market real quick. Maybe just uh, if you could just get a bit more granular on that. What do you, you mean by that? Like how how is that linked? Because um, I do want to talk about higher bond bond yields and whether yeah. the bond market is forcing the Fed to actually keep rates higher for longer and maybe even yeah. increase rates yet again. And that's yeah. uh, if, if we see well, that trend. So can can you explain that just a little bit more sure. in detail? Throughout history, there's been a very um, close negative. Uh, correlation between bond yields and um, equity values. I mean, as reflected by indices, for example. Um, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that uh, a rising equity market requires falling bond yields. And equally, when you get bond yields rising, uh, you get falling equity markets. Now, it's not as straightforward as that, obviously, because there are other um, uh, factors that uh, go into the valuation of equities, not least uh, uh, speculation. I mean, there's very high speculation in equities. I mean, that's why you have equity bubbles. Um, the interesting thing is that this negative correlation, you can show it in a chart by, um, uh, you know, bringing them back to the bringing, uh, you know, yield and uh, the S&P back to a common value, say one. Um, in the year 2000 or the uh, 1990 or 1980 or whatever like that and then plot them on a log scale and put them on different axes and you can actually see that they very closely correlate now when did they not correlate well they didn't correlate in the dot-com bubble for the year 2000 now we can understand that um, completely and as the dot-com bubble continued, um, you know, interest rates began to rise and that tripped the whole thing up. There was also, um, uh, um, if you like, non-correlation over the great financial crisis. Um, when we had, a, um, if you like, a big fall in equities um, without the commensurate fall in bond yields, uh, though bond yields had risen, but the gap widened up. And also when the Fed just sort of chucked money at the system and um, bond yields fell substantially, 
then again, uh, equities were left behind, so you had that gap. You had a similar gap um, over COVID um, when um, you know the economy basically stopped. Um, equities held back while bond yields saw uh, bond yields collapsed. If you like, sorry, they, yeah, bond yields collapsed. So again, you had a big gap. The gap today is the other way around. Uh, we have equities expensive, and bond yields. Um, you know, have, have risen, making equities look very, very vulnerable. And indeed, the gap uh, in the, na the negative correlation between bond yields and uh, equity values is even greater today than it was at the time of the dot-com bubble. This is an accident waiting to happen. And it's clear that the next uh, rise in bond yields will do it. And I, I remember, um, you know, when I was a stockbroker back in the 70s, I remember the relationship between bond yields, interest rates and equities in the 70s. Um, we had a bear market in, in, in gilts in 1973. It started taking equities down. But there was one sector in, in, in particular which held up very well because it was meant to be, everybody realized that, you know, inflation was a problem and all the rest of it. And they could see that, uh, prices were rising. Uh, how do you hedge out of it? Well, you buy property. That was obviously the uh, inflation hedge. But it got to the point where in October 73, late October 73, the Bank of England had raised interest rates, um, uh, you know, because the whole thing was getting out of, out of, out of kilter. They couldn't fund. Nobody was buying gilts. Uh, so yields had to rise and they had to raise interest rates in order to trigger that. Um, what happened? Uh, you had a collapse of the property market. I remember the, the you know, the commercial real estate stocks on the market. I mean, they collapsed. I mean, when I say collapsed, like last 90% in a week, <laughs> on you know, across virtually all of them. So, um, you, you know, the, you've got to look at the relationship, if you like, between uh, what credit yields and what equities yield. I mean, when they get... Uh, you know, too far stretched, then it's very, very dangerous. And I would say that's exactly where we are today. Yeah, it looks like the the bond market is sort of forcing the Fed's hand to a degree. It's like it's almost like the bond vigilantes have returned and uh, are dictating the market. Uh, the, the dictating the market is that something you would uh, agree with? Is that something? Will the Fed actually be forced to keep those rates? And uh, <laughs> I've, I've mentioned that earlier to keep those rates higher, even raise rates to keep up with the bond market. I, well, I, I think um, bond vigila vid, uh, vigilantes is slightly um, misleading because I would say that that um, uh, description applies to, say, your domestic pension funds and uh, insurance companies who effectively are telling the central bank, look, or telling the treasury, uh, these yields are not attractive to us. You know, we, we're not going to buy it at this level. That, I think, was the vigilantes. Nowadays, we have foreigners who basically are up to the necks in dollars. I mean, like 32 trillion in, in uh, dollars and underlying financial assets. I mean, of the 32 trillion, something like six or seven trillion is, is in bank deposits or, or, or money markets. But, you know, the rest of it is exposed to uh, bonds of various sorts and uh, also equities. I mean, there's a lot of portfolio stuff. I think it was about 14 and a half trillion or something in, in, in equities. So um, these I don't think are vigilantes. These are people who are already very, very long and have actually no reason to be other than purely speculative or maybe on the margins need some dollars in order to conduct international business, but certainly not these quantities. And that, I think, is the underlying problem. And with a debt uh, to GDP ratio of 135 percent, you've got either Harris or Trump, neither of which are going to cut um, budget deficits in the foreseeable future. I mean, I think Trump hopes that um, what will happen is that, uh, you know, his cut in taxes and his protection for um, U.S. Uh, industry through tariffs and all the rest of it uh, will mean that, um, you know, revenue will recover, let's say, on a two to three year view. Um, yeah. But meanwhile, we've got huge, great deficits. And the problem with Trump, I mean, Trump at the moment is leading in the polls. I mean, big time. It looks like Harris is a dead duck.
completely. Um, unless they can somehow pull a rabbit out of the hat, you know, like hanging well, chads. We, we got, what is it? We got five days. We got five days for yeah, a Black Swan event. Exactly. Yeah. Or exactly. a false flag or something. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist. Well, uh, but, yeah. Uh, we got five let, days let's for something to happen. down the conspiracy right? route. Anyway, um, <laughs> as far as the foreigners are concerned, what do they know about Trump? They read the headlines. You know, they don't necessarily follow through on, um, you know, this is, a, this is actually a very different Trump from last time round. But, you know, when they read the headlines, like, um, you know, he's going to rely on um, punitive tariffs against foreigners, build a wall around America. Um, he's going to cut income tax. He's going to cut corporation tax. What does that do to the budget deficit? You know, if you're a foreigner, you look at this and you remember the uncertainties of a Trump administration in the past and you put you know, hopes like he's going to do a peace deal with <laughs> over Ukraine, put that on the back burner. But I mean, if you've got dollars, you know, this is frightening. This is frightening to a foreigner. I actually think it's very different from that because you don't get geniuses like um, Elon Musk and um, clever men like and, and thoughtful men like um, uh, Robert Kennedy um, and uh, what's the name? Is it Tulsi Gabbard? You know, I mean, you know, th there are some very, very clever people surrounding Trump. Um, and um, I don't know they'll necessarily get it right. I don't know that they'll necessarily manage to achieve what they would seek to achieve. But um, there is a bit more promise on the domestic front, if you like, for domestic um, investors, uh, for uh, let's say the U.S. financial establishment, um, in a, you know, in with with a Trump victory, perhaps in a Harris victory. So I mean, but as far as the foreigners are concerned, you know, no, they don't want to. They really don't want to know about this. It's this is of great concern to them. Alistair, I have one follow up question because one of your numbers doesn't match the numbers I have. So I'm curious. 135 percent debt to GDP. I, I have 122. Just curious, like how do you build that number? Like. Uh, well, I mean, I just look at um, the amount of debt that's there and uh, estimates of GDP. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're no, like, I'm just looking at trading policy. economics. So just uh, see if you factor anything else. And like, because actually the debt to GDP ratio, and that's that's the thing that actually blows my mind. It's not the 122%, which is extremely high, but it's that it's been stable and it's dropped since 2020. Well, that's the thing that blows is, my if mind. It, if, if, it's, <laughs> if it's dropped, it is because someone's estimate of GDP uh, has been revised upwards, sort of thing. Yeah, so the three percent GDP but, growth last yeah, quarter. It's, it's um, not the debt dropping, that's for sure. No. Um, and uh, of course, the other thing, Kai, is that if you look at the performance of the U.S. economy, um, it's not all that brilliant. Um, you know, on paper, it looks better than most of us, but I mean that reflects government credit being pushed into the economy. This is not production. I mean, this is where the GDP is actually so misleading. It's just credit numbers. You know, it's the value of all the transactions in a given period. Um, and uh, it doesn't tell you, you know, what the quality of those transactions are. I mean, the government can go in and spend grillions and suddenly the GDP looks wonderful before, of course, inflation catches up with it. Uh, and that's roughly where we are today. It's like a anyway, pump and dump I mean, job I, in junior mining, right? Uh, you, you, it works as long as you keep pumping into the marketing campaign. But if you stop that marketing campaign, you get that waterfall chart. That's exactly Sorry, you're, you're breaking. you're breaking up. Oh, I apologize. Like it, it, it feels like it's like a mining, like in mining, like where we come from. It's like one of those pump and dump jobs. Like it works fine as long as you keep a lot of pumping, a lot of money, in, money into the promotion. But the second yeah. you you turn the faucet off and the money disappears from the pump, from the promotion, it falls, it falls apart. It's like a it, Christmas yeah. tree chart almost. Absolutely, right? I think that's a very good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alistair, like I want to spend ch change gears just a little bit. We've talked about enough about the Fed and like what the implications are of higher yields, of course. But uh, we do need to talk about why the gold price keeps going up. Like maybe a bit of a summary of what we discussed just now. Um, we, we established that it wasn't the BRICS currency and the rumor of a BRICS currency that's gold backed uh, coming up, pushing gold higher. It's other factors. And I think we need to summarize maybe our conversation here a little bit and maybe come to a conclusion. Like, will it keep rising? Um, is there steam left in the kettle? And uh, how are things looking, Alistair, there? OK, I think the most important point to understand, and I'll say this as slowly as I can uh, without boring everybody, is it's not gold rising. It's the dollar and currencies falling. That's the whole thing. It's credit going down. 
So the idea that this is a gold bull market is actually a misnomer. It's a bear market for fiat currencies. So I have to ask you, um, dear viewer, you know, you have a currency, your, every currency, including yours, is based on the faith and credit in it, in the words of someone who gave uh, evidence to Congress whenever it was, and it was accepted by Congress that this was the case with the fiat currency. It depends on people's faith and the credit that it gives to the government, which is the issuer. So I have to ask you, how's your faith in this um, cr and, and credit in your currency uh, evolving? <coughs> I think the answer is twindling. And that right? answers so... <laughs> that answers the situation. I mean, if you're if you think your government is wonderful and they're doing wonderful things with your currency and um, you've got nothing to worry about, then don't buy gold. If, on the other hand, you're taking a view which might be deteriorating uh, of your currency, then um, you, you ought to look to get some real money and real money by law from Roman times, from the 12 tables, which is the first attempt at Roman law back in four, 448 BC. Um, they defined what the difference was between money and credit. You know, money in those days was um, was, was metal and actually it was bronze. Um, that was the first Roman coin, something called the ice, which spelled A-E-S, uh, which weighed something like two thirds of a pound. I mean, it was quite heavy, um, you know, third of a kilo, if you like, <laughs> if, you, if you're in Europe. Uh, and um, gold actually came in later. But I mean, it was adopted in common law that gold, silver and copper um, uh, represent final payment and everything else is credit. How you value credit, now that evolved with jurors over you know, the, the thousand years from the 12 tables up until uh, Just, Justinian's Pandex. Um, uh, but it's written in everybody's common law. It doesn't matter what governments say, you know, gold is a pet rock or it's no longer part of the financial system. I mean, there's a load of rubbish. It is in common law. It's quite simple. So how's your feeling about your credit? I mean, are you, have you still got faith in your government and uh, uh, the credit? Of its that's, a, that's a whole different topic there, Alistair, our German government. <laughs> I mean, you even have economists, um, you know, economists telling me that, oh, no, 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 currency is, is not credit, it's, it's, it's money. But, you know, so, and I, I point out that uh, if you just look at a central bank balance sheet, I mean, it's on there as a liability. It does, it's credit by any definition. So, yeah, how's your faith in it? You know, big question. If you don't like it, go for real money. And real money is not as it's so going up. It's actually, you know, it's pretty stable. It's an international value. Um, and uh, I mean, I looked at um, Diocletian's um, Edict of Maximum Prices, dated from about 303 AD. And uh, pricing everything in gold as opposed to denarii, which, uh, which was more or less the currency at the time. Pricing it in gold <coughs> at the then uh, supposed exchange rate. I mean, there are lots of prices that are exactly the same uh, today. Um, and uh, if you look at oil, it's a very, very good example. Energy, the cost of energy of 1950. The price of a barrel of oil was $2.53 or something. Um, and gold was um, uh, at $35. Um, you look at uh, the price today, uh, West Te Texas Intermediate is now, um, what, 70 odd, uh, and it's been 140. And it actually went negative at one stage because of a you know, foul up on the, on, on the derivatives market. Um, but uh, value in gold, hardly changed, just goes along, boom, 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 like that. So, you know, bear in mind, it's not gold going up, it's your currency collapsing. Get out of credit. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the YouTube thumbnail tag as well. Get out of credit. But no, Alistair, like as always, a wonderful conversation with you. We do have to wrap it up here, unfortunately. I've, um, I don't want to run over an hour here, but uh, where can we follow your work? And uh, you, you've got your sub stack that you've recently started or recently. It's been a year now, I think, right? Yeah. It's, it's been a while. Yeah, it's uh, yes. I, I've been doing my sub stacks since uh, January, February, and um, I'm pleased to say it's gone very well. No doubt helped a little bit by, by um, people thinking that gold's in a bear market without actually realizing it's their currency in a bear market. But anyway, um, 
and the objective is to really help people understand what the hell's going on in these increasingly febrile times. Um, and it's it's a question not just of understanding precious metals markets. It's also a question of understanding politics, economics and geopolitics. And so I put all that into the mix. Um, and I do regular postings as and when. Sometimes it's three or four a week. Um, but it'll never be less than two a week. So that's something which um, I, I would urge people to subscribe to if they really want to understand what um, is becoming a matter of financial life and death for them. No, I think it's vitally important. I think a lot of more people are jumping on the, the gold bandwagon here. And, and uh, I don't even want to call it, it almost sounds uh, demeaning to, to gold, but uh, or jumping on the one real asset that's out there. We haven't talked silver, but uh, I think we can throw it in the same basket, but uh, to a lesser degree. Is that correct? Yeah, um, it's 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 interesting. I mean, I think we'll you know we'll do that another day. But um, broadly speaking, when gold rises, silver rises about twice as fast. Sometimes it leads gold um, on that. The always the risk with it is that when gold stops rising, silver falls back twice as fast. Um, and if nothing's happening in gold, um, you know it can be manipulated down. But um, there's a shortage of the stuff, so you know basically just ignore the volatility and just stay with it <laughs> buy the dip a lot of people have said it on our channel before buy the dip in either gold or silver i think uh, momentum is with us and uh, mm. momentum is strong uh, right um alistair thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it we'll need to catch up early in the new year uh, to see you uh, what your forecast for the years of course as well where, where are bond yields going uh, where's gold going of course we'll need to talk about it whether things are stabilizing in the global financial system we all know the answer, but uh, we do need to talk about it still. And uh, everybody else, you know, thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate you watching. Um, a free way to support us is just by simply hitting that like and subscribe button. Leave a comment. Did you enjoy the episode? Should we have asked something different? What should we ask Alistair next time? Um, yeah, why, why, why don't we do that? Like, uh, We'll definitely have Alistair back in three, four months. We'll probably catch up early in the new year. Um, if you have some questions for Alistair, please put them down in the comments below and uh, we'll get to them. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Sword Financially. We'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you.